So as many of you know, tonight's program was made possible by the generous support of the New Jersey Legislature um, for the Senator Winona Lippman Chair in Women's Political Leadership. The chair honors the first African-American woman in the state Senate representing Essex County for 27 years in the New Jersey Legislature. Over those years, she became the strongest and most consistent voice in the legislature for women and minorities. She was the leading advocate for children, families, low-income people, small businesses, and people with AIDS. She tackled issues including employment discrimination, marriage law, child support, sexual assault, domestic violence, and the rights of, child of children. She was the living example of women making a difference. Senator Lippman also taught at Essex County College and was a great supporter of New Jersey's community colleges. For many of the years that she served in the Senate, she was the only woman there. She was always speaking up for those with the least access to the political process, always alert to the political implications of race and gender. I encourage you all to learn more about this political pioneer by reading her full bio, which is on our website. Through the legislature's continuing support for the Lippman Chair, we've been able to bring an extraordinary roster of distinguished women to Rutgers to inspire us, and tonight is no exception. We are joined tonight by our good friend, Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter. Shavonda, thank you. Shavonda has a huge fan club at the Center for American Women in Politics. We are always rooting for her. Um, and I hope that you will go back to the legislature and convey our thanks to your colleagues for their continuing support of this work and for trusting us to honor the memory and the legacy of Senator Lippman. Now, when we select someone for the Lippman Lecture, we look for parallels or connections with Senator Lippman, a logic that suggests that person would be a good fit for this role. It's not hard to make those links this year. And in fact, when we got word that our dream introducer would be able to join us, it turned out that the links extended to her as well. I'm going to introduce that person briefly and then let her present our speaker. Sheila Oliver, and you can all applaud now. <laughs> Sheila Oliver is, like Senator Lippman and April Ryan, a pioneer and a pathbreaker. Assemblywoman, and now Lieutenant Governor elect Oliver. <laughs> was New Jersey's second woman and first black woman to serve as Speaker of the Assembly, and only the second black woman in the nation to lead a legislative chamber. In her new role, she will be just the 12th black woman elected to statewide elected executive office anywhere in this country in the history of this country. And she is the first Democratic woman lieutenant governor, joining three Republican black women who have held that title. Like Senator Lippman, she represents Essex County, and she cares deeply about many of the same issues that moved Senator Lippman. Soon, she will serve the entire state, not only as second in command to Governor-elect Phil Murphy, but as his designated commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs, a powerful post to which she will bring great expertise. I am delighted to welcome her to one of her first major public appearances since the election. We're feeling very, very flattered by this. And it's now my great honor to present our introducer, Lieutenant Governor-elect Sheila Oliver. Good evening, everyone. I love how Deborah said that this was uh, one of my, quote, first public appearances. Uh, I hope I'm seen in public with frequency. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. 
Um, you know, um, it's good to be at Rutgers. It's always good to be at our flagship university. And it is more than wonderful to be here tonight uh, as we have this year's Winona M. Lippman Chair grace us. And uh, you know, uh, when I think about Winona Lippman and I think about April Ryan, Deborah, without question, pointed out their parallels. And I'm glad to see so many students here. And uh, I like to keep up with popular culture with uh, my millennials. And I just have to say I'm super excited tonight. Because <laughs> uh, my millennials taught me that word, super excited. Um, so, uh, you know, it's my honor and it is definitely my privilege uh, to uh, be here tonight. April Ryan has often been the only black woman in her professional setting. In this case, the White House press room. Uh, also in common with Senator Lippman, April has gone beyond the narrowest confines of her role to take responsibility for an underserved constituency. Developing expertise in the particular issues and concerns that matter most to that constituency. April has a unique vantage point as the only black female correspondent covering urban issues from the White House. And given this White House, April, we definitely need your voice in the room. Now, this position that April has, uh, being in the White House press room, she's held since the Clinton era. Uh, on behalf of the American Radio, uh, the American Urban Radio Network, and through her Fabric of America news blog, she delivers her readership and listeners um, on close to 300 radio affiliates, uh, reaching millions of African Americans all around the country and beyond. Uh, she has a unique perspective and brings a perspective of the minority voice in this country to the news. Her position has afforded her unusual insight into the racial sensitivities, issues, and attendant political struggles of our nation's last presidents. April can be seen almost daily on CNN as a political analyst. She has been featured in Vogue, Cosmopolitan, Elle Magazine, The New York Times, The Washington Post, just to name a few. And I know Essence has covered you too, April. <laughs> All right. <laughs> she is the 2017 National Association of Black Journalists Journalist of the Year and a, were you there when Amorosa gave him a hard time? All right. uh, she was the, uh, the uh, 2017 National Association of Black Journalists Journalist of the Year, a Turker fellow with the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. Ms. Ryan has served on the board of the prestigious White House Correspondents Association, one of only three African Americans in the association's over 100 year history to do so. Let us applaud her for that. And in 2015, she was nominated for an NAACP Image Award for her first book. April is the author of the award-winning book, The Presidency in Black and White, as well as her latest book, At Mama's Knee, Mothers and Race in Black and White, a look at race relations through the lessons and wisdom that mothers have given their children. Her book will be on sale here tonight, and she will have a few minutes at the end of the program to sign copies of her book. April is a Baltimore native and a graduate of Big Ups, Morgan State University, where she now serves as a mentor to aspiring journalists. She counts as her life's greatest work, 
raising her two phenomenal daughters, Ryan and Grace. Given all that has been happening in Washington of late, and in the White House press room in particular, I know that you are all eager to hear from our speaker. She will always go down indelibly in my heart for chasing Spicy out of the White House <laughs> correspondence room. And without further ado, I present to you the great April Ryan. Ooh. Amazing words from a powerful woman. And I'm going to say, I'm going to take my news hat off for a minute. I love powerful women. I was raised by one. I have a bunch of them in my family. If anything ever goes wrong, that's who you go to. And I did an interview with the lieutenant governor-elect earlier. She had me going, hmm. She said she will place a firewall, and I'm not going to go into it, but she said she's going to place a firewall around the state to protect the state. And I said, all right now, the power of women. Good evening, Rutgers University. Good evening. You can do better than that. All right, you showed up for something. I'm here for something. <laughs> I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank the Eagleton Institute, Deb and Ruth. Thank you so much for having me. This is amazing. Ruth's office is a museum. I saw pictures that I've never seen before, stories I've never heard before. If you have not heard or seen, please go on the other side of the campus and take a listen. It's amazing. And I'm also thankful to be your lecturer tonight for this lecture series, the Winona Lipman Lecture Series. I read up on her. I can't believe that you would think of me that way. This great woman in 1971, 1971, was elected as your US Senator, or as your state Senator, excuse me, New Jersey State Senator. And I'm hearing stories that just blow my mind. She didn't have an office. In 1971, she sat on the windowsill. They didn't make room. Lieutenant Governor-elect, the bathroom. All men's club. All men's club. They had a bathroom, but she didn't. They said, oh, if we get more women we might think about having a bathroom. And when you said that, Lieutenant Governor-elect, I thought about hidden figures and Taraji P. Henson. How many of you know what I'm talking about? When you got to go, you got to go. And you make a way out of no way, right? <laughs> but it's indeed an honor to be here this evening. And yes, a lot of times, I am one of the few or the only in the room. And when you're that one voice in the wind, it's important, especially when other people are talking about other things. It's important at a time like this. And I say that to say, we watch CNN. We watch CNN. We watch CNN. You notice I say we watch CNN. Some of us are so in tuned to politics that we can't do anything else. Because there's been a shift in the atmosphere. There's been a shift in the atmosphere. And, and when I say there's a shift in the atmosphere, it didn't just happen a year ago. That shift happened a long time ago. But the issue is, when it happened, where were you in that moment? Were you in a place of comfort 
or in dis-ease. I'm gonna say this again. When that shift happened, and it didn't happen a year ago, where were you? I'm not talking about your body, but where was your mind? Where was your spirit? Where were you? Were you in a place of comfort or dis-ease? And as a reporter at the White House, this most glorious place, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, where kings and queens and, and presidents have come to talk to the leader of the free world, I watch. I watch people. I watch those who are happy and I watch those who are sad. I watch those who are in a state of discomfort. The question is, where are you today in 2017? I think about 1971, Winona Littman. I think about those stories. And that was just a couple of years. It was less than 10 years after the Civil Rights Act was passed and the Voting Rights Act was passed. Now, for those of you who don't know your history, I'm going to tell you to Google it. <laughs> but the Civil Rights Act, if it weren't for the Civil Rights Act being passed, I would not be here with you tonight. And many of you would not be in this room. Because of that act, we are now allowed to drive down south and go to sleep in a hotel room. I think about people like Charles Drew. If you don't know him, look him up. Google it. Charles Drew revolutionized, revolutionized the blood donation system in this country. A black man. He was a black man at the time when they were fighting for first-class citizenship, the Civil Rights Act had not been passed. He was tired traveling down south, fell asleep at the wheel. His injuries were so severe, they took him to a hospital. This man revolutionized, revolutionized the blood donation system in this country, in this world that many of us have benefited from blood transfusions, et cetera. But his injuries were so severe, they took him to the hospital. This man of such acclaim was taken to the basement for the black patients. But a white doctor noticed who he was and said, take him upstairs. But he died. If the Civil Rights Act were in place, Charles Drew could still be with us, possibly. He would have been able to sleep in that hotel room on the side of Interstate 95. That was before the Civil Rights Act. Then think about the Voting Rights Act. And now look at 2017, the first time we voted in 50 years without the full enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. They're talking voter fraud. We've been talking voter suppression for a long time. Counting bubbles, counting chewing gum. Hmm. 2017 versus 1971. She couldn't get the full support of the men in the room. Interesting. Now let's look to 2017. <laughs> Take a picture of it. Take a picture of 2017. If you close your eyes, turn your head, and make the picture black and white, you think you're where? Yes. Think about it. I think about 1971, but her struggles <laughs> were not the only struggles. But she spoke up because she was in a state of dis-ease. I think about the next woman in 1972 Powerful woman. I saw a picture of her in Ruth's office. Ruth and Deb have a picture with her. 1972, there was this powerful African-American woman just up the road who dared to change the system. 1972, she said, I'm running. I'm running before Jesse, before Lenore Filani. I'm running. And when she ran, she said, you know, 
being a black woman. Being a woman and a black woman means you have a double whammy. But she also understood her condition. But she said, you know what? I may have a double whammy, but I'm going to be at the table. So what she did, she said, if you don't have a seat at the table, what'd you say? Bring a folding chair. No, not just a chair, a folding chair. There was a sense of dis-ease. Now, throughout these stories we're talking, I'm not talking about politics, am I? I'm not talking about politics. Yes, I sit and I've covered four American presidents, a kid from Baltimore, there before the grace of God go I. Kid from Baltimore, be more careful town. <laughs> I love my city, let it go. <laughs> but think about this. I'm not talking about politics. When you get in the weeds of it, it's not about politics. Yeah, I've heard the president say, this, thus, thou art, make policies and, and, and executive orders. But guess what? At the end of the day, it's not about politics. It's not about party. It's about the heart. As a man thinketh, so is he. It's about the heart, humanity towards humanity. And I see every day, see of faces that come to the White House hoping for change. There are markers throughout our lifetime that we've seen. People wanted change. One of those pillars was Abraham Lincoln there was a shift, there was a change. Not the compromise that General Kelly was talking about, but, <laughs> and I got in trouble for that, but guess what? Sarah. <laughs> but there was a pillar the first pillar of this nation because of humanity, not about politics. Think about this. It's not necessarily about politics or party. It's about humanity. Abraham Lincoln, the Emancipation Proclamation. Then there's another pillar, JFK and LBJ, and I dare to say RFK, Robert F. Kennedy too. Then there was another pillar who wasn't presidential, but he galvanized the nation with only 4% of black churches behind him. Who am I talking about? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. With only 4% of the churches, black churches behind him, he changed the system. Young people changed the system. And then I think about the next pillar and the next marker, when a lot of these things happen, we remember who we are and where we were, what we felt, what it smelled like. You bathe in it, you know? I remember the night that Barack Obama was elected president of the United States. I never thought it was going to happen. I was in shock. I wasn't in Grant Park. I wasn't in Grant Park where everybody was. But the best place to be was at the White House. People thought they did something. People thought they did something. They were saying, oh, we're, we're post-racial. We did it. I'm like, oh, mm, OK. <laughs> kids coming from George Washington and, and other kids coming from Howard and other kids coming from Georgetown and people just running the street. I saw some kids. That I thought they were at a football game in Wisconsin. They had no shirt on, <laughs> running through the streets. It was bitter cold that night. But I remember that marker in time. Ruth, do you? I remember that marker. And not for the reason why you think. It's not about politics. It's about humanity. I think about the moment that Wolf Blitzo on CNN said at 11 o'clock, Barack Obama will be the 44th president of the United States of America. I was like, what? I am sitting in my booth in the White House 
in the West Wing, 150 feet from the Oval Office, George W. Bush was still president. He had his little watch party upstairs, because normally they go to bed at nine o'clock, but he was awake. <laughs> but it's true, he was awake. <clears throat> but the kids were in the streets screaming. They were happy, and I'm like, I couldn't believe it. So I get out of my comfort zone. I get out of my seat. I'm in shock. I didn't cry. I know all of y'all were all on the floor crying. Oh my God. But I didn't cry. I was like, what? But I walked down the hall to a friend, an African-American reporter who's since retired. His name is Wendell Goler, who worked for Fox News. He, stop it. He was sitting. <laughs> He was sitting in the Fox News booth. And I just walked to the door. And I looked at him in disbelief. And I'm still in disbelief. I remember the moment. I feel it. And I looked at him like, what? I was in shock. Because I'm from that generation and, and from the community that said that we would never see it because they would kill him. Remember that? And let's, let's, let's speak truth and shame the devil. And I said, oh, it never happened. And it happened. And I'm standing there looking at Wendell, and he's looking back at me in shock. And I just walked close to him. And he grabbed me by the waist and started crying. That marker. And I'll never forget that night after that, after Wendell cried his tears, I walked outside and watched the kids saying, na, 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 hey, Bush, goodbye. <laughs> the Bushes were still upstairs. They heard it, but there was a shift. And it's not about politics. There was a shift. So the next day, and I'm still there, I was on Fox News at four and five o'clock that morning. They haven't called me back, but <laughs> I was on Fox News that morning. And then I go back to work about 10 o'clock and I still see the balloons, the red, white, and blue balloons that have wafted over the, the wrought iron fence in celebration of the first black president. So at that time, George W. Bush wanted to mark the occasion. He did, came out to the Rose Garden, but before he came out to the Rose Garden, he was angry about something. I was strategically placed in front of the area, in front of the Oval Office with the French doors, and I watched him pace back and forth in the room angrily not knowing what he was angry about. But when he saw me, he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he stopped. For that moment, the anger left, and he saw me, and he did this. <laughs> he raised the roof because <laughs> this Republican president saw a shift in this nation. Now, that's the George W. Bush I know. The other one, which you know, that's not what I know. But he saw a shift in this nation, and he marked the occasion. But then, and I think about how Barack Obama won. How did Barack Obama win? He talked about change. Change. He felt a disease in this nation, and he wanted to shift the body politic. So eight years later, where are we? I remember another moment, you could smell it, you could taste it, you could feel it. That morning, I knew Hillary Clinton wasn't gonna win. I smelt it, I tasted it. And if you watched me, I kept telling you, Donald Trump could be our next president. I kept saying it. And that night, remember about two or three o'clock in the morning, how many of you stayed up? <laughs> but see, wait a minute, okay, okay, calm down, <laughs> calm down, <laughs> calm down. I see some of you still in the fetal position even though you put your shoes on. It's okay, <laughs> it's okay. It's gonna be all right, Just hold on. <laughs> Donald Trump keenly and brilliantly understood 
Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, then candidate Donald Trump, keenly and brilliantly understood that the system is broken. There's something wrong. There are people still on the fringe. He did what Barack Obama did in the opposite version. Change. People are feeling a dis-ease. This is not about politics. This is about the heart. Think about each candidate and who they tried to attract. So when I look at the pillar of, or the marker, we've got pillars and we've got markers. January 20th, 2017, was the next marker in our life as this country. People said, oh, we are post-racial when Barack Obama was president. No, because mm -mm, it's still happening. Racism is still a problem. Genderism, sexism, all that stuff. Every ism is still in full effect. Why? Because the heart and mind are out of line. It's not about politics. That's just a cover for it. But now the new marker is, it's not post-racial, but post-Obama. What does post-Obama look like? Here we go. So I say to you, as we're here at Rutgers, trying to find out what's next and, and what do we do, I think about election night. I think about election night. I think about people being in a state of dis-ease and discomfort. I watched my friends on social media. A lot of them had a lot to say. One of them, his name is Chris Darden. Stop. <laughs> Y'all are bad. <laughs> Former prosecutor in the O.J. Simpson trial black Republican, he said, and he's a friend of mine, he said, a good friend, he said, you know, on Facebook, I was just watching, I wanted to see what people were saying. He said, oh my God, the village idiot has been given the keys to the White House. I said, oh, Chris, you're in trouble. And then he said, it's a time for activism. I said, okay, Chris. So then a couple weeks later, I'm listening, I'm watching people. I mean, I'm seeing people crying, acting like the world has come to an end. I'm like, it's okay. Breathe. You're all right. I watched Bob Johnson from Black Entertainment Television, the founder of BET, go to the golf course here in New Jersey and meet with President-elect Trump. And he said, this is a time for unity and finding common ground. I said, okay. Both friends made sense, but people were still on the floor. So then I said, I don't understand. I said, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this. Again, I didn't cry, I'm just in shock. I'm trying to wrap my mind around this. And I go to a friend of mine by the name of Kwaisi Fume, my first program director in radio at Morgan State University. I said, Kwaisi, this is what Chris is saying, and this is what Bob is saying. What do you say? He said, both men are right, but we are at a crossroads. I said, OK. So then everybody's still in discomfort and disease, depending upon who you were, where you were. So I reach out to Harry Belafonte. And he says, come to my home. And you're not going to turn down Harry Belafonte. <laughs> So I traveled to Harry Belafonte's home. And Ruth, like, you have all your museum of pictures. He's got some pictures. Along the wall, just going into the foyer of his home, pictures with Dr. King and, and a whole full body laugh. I mean, things that pictures you'd never see before. His home is, is a living legacy of activism. I said, Mr. Belafonte, you're an icon, you're a humanitarian, you were an activist before you were an entertainer. Where are we? He said, let me tell you something. 
He said, at a time like this, what W.E.B. Du Bois told me when I walked with Dr. King and Paul Robeson, but W.E.B. Du Bois told me this. He said, this is one of the greatest times in the world. I was like, what? I'm like, I know you're 90, but are you okay? <laughs> he was like, no, listen to me. You're too young to understand, but just listen. I said, okay. I was waiting for him to start going day-o. <laughs> I said, I'm, I was with you for a minute, <laughs> Mr. Palafonte. But he made such sense. He said, this is the greatest time. He said, when people are in great pain, when they are in great pain, that's a time for radical activism that effectuates change. So I go back to, to Senator Lippman and, and, and Shirley Chisholm. They activate it in their way. Lippman started out in the PTA and in the NAACP, but she took it a step further. The work is not over in 2017. So Harry Belafonte, this great man, says this, and I'm like, okay, look at Inauguration Day. I was there, I've covered every inauguration since Clinton, but I'm gonna tell you something. I was able to walk through those crowds <laughs> this Inauguration Day, I have I have never seen bleachers empty. I was like, what? So, left after everything, you know, and got caught up. I'm thinking it's the 21 gun salute. There were flashbangs, people riding. I'm like, oh, let me get out of here. I was able to maneuver throughout the crowd and go home. During the Obama years, it took me an hour and a half to get to a point that I would go for 15 minutes in a 15 minute walk. So I'm telling you, don't believe the hype. <laughs> so the next day, and this is why I'm telling you, you matter. Don't think that your world has come to an end because you matter. The next day, the next day, a few women said, I'm not gonna sit home, I'm upset. A couple women said, all right, this is it. They got up and started walking around in London, England, Sydney, Australia. They started walking around in New York City. They started walking around in Baltimore. They were walking around in Los Angeles, Lansing, Detroit, and Washington, D.C. They walked around so much and with so many people. My dear friend, Sean Spicer, couldn't help himself. <laughs> that day, that poor man came out with an ill-fitting suit. <laughs> There've never been numbers greater than this! <laughs> okay, Sean. I'm telling you! <laughs> suit all jacked up. <laughs> I was like, oh boy, this is where we are going. And I couldn't believe what I saw. But they watched. They saw. Those numbers that Saturday dwarfed the numbers that Friday. They watched. Activism makes a difference. But only imagine if those women would have kept it going if they would have kept it going. The unfortunate thing is, in some communities, resources are not as prevalent in other, as in other communities. But if those women kept walking and marching, see, some communities have understood one of the most successful movements and blueprints is the civil rights movement. Some communities, the ones who invented the blueprint, have dropped the blueprint. The women's rights groups, LGBTQ community, the immigration community have picked up the blueprint and they march on state houses, they march on city hall, and they march on Washington. 
Sean came to the podium because the numbers were too strong to ignore. So what do you do at a time such as this, where a tax plan is passed and teachers have to lose out for paying for supplies? What do you do at a time when women aren't at the table when they are creating repeal and replace for ACA? And we have pre-existing conditions. We are a community that have pre-existing conditions. What do you do when we are the strongest women or the strongest voting bloc and you're ignored? What do you do when you have issues of Charlottesville? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do when you have an issue where a congresswoman is challenged for her truth? As a reporter, this is what I cover. I look to you to see what you do. But I've seen how change comes. It's not about politics. It's about the heart. I'm not here to bash anybody. Yeah, orange is the new black, but I'm not here to bash anyone. <laughs> it's about the heart. As a man thinketh, so is he. But I'll leave you with this. You are the change you seek. You are the change you seek. I've seen it time and time again. In Washington, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, and I'm sure here in New Jersey it's the same thing, and down the road in Philly, and up the road in New York. And I know in Baltimore that's what happens. You are the change that you seek. But the question is, and this is what I do, I ask questions. I'm raising my hand to ask each and every one of you a question tonight. Are you in that much of a state of dis-ease to change your condition? It's not about going on Twitter and having a Twitter rant behind an emoji that nobody knows who you are. You can cuss me out on Twitter, I'll sit there and laugh at you. But are you in a place to change your own dynamic? Are you at a place to say, I'm ready for change? I'm ready to pick up the mantle that was left by Lipman and, and others? And Shirley Chisholm and Fannie Lou Hamer, she's sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I'm going to leave you with this. We're talking about current day, but I'm going to go way back. There was a woman that my mother used to always talk to me about. She has a quote talking about how she was like a weed, ignorant of liberty, having no understanding of it. They called her grandma. This woman had a sense of dis-ease, not understanding what it really was, but she knew it wasn't right. So what she did, she grabbed a couple of people, said, come on, I'm gonna take you somewhere. She snuck into some of the plantations and took some of our ancestors and said, I'm gonna take you somewhere. She took them north to freedom. Because as a slave, she didn't understand what was going on, but she knew something wasn't right. Her spirit was in a state of dis-ease. But because she was determined, and because she wanted to make sure everything was okay for her people, she never lost a slave on that train. She kept going back as the dogs and the masters were running after her because she took their profits, but she led people to freedom. Not knowing the whole totality of what was going on, she was in a state of dis-ease and she did something about it. So the question tonight for you, what is your dis-ease? What is your displeasure? You have to think about that tonight and figure out if you're gonna be the change that you seek. With that, aspire to inspire. Thank you.
So we are very lucky to have April here tonight, and we are even luckier because she has agreed to take some questions. So we have a microphone uh, in the middle of the aisle there, and if people would line up uh, to ask some questions. And there we have our first. <laughs> Hello, sir. Hi, Ms. Ryan. Hi. Well, thank you for being here. I watch you on TV all the time. Thank you. Uh, Which channel? CNN. CNN. Yes. <laughs> also known as fake news. According to oh, Trump. no, 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 no. Just kidding, no. Lisa. We're not going serious. that. No, we're not going there. Go ahead. <laughs> Why did you chase Sean Spicer out? I enjoyed watching I'm him. I'm sorry, what did you say? Why did you chase Sean Spicer out? I really enjoyed watching he him. He did it to himself. He was hilarious. But he, he was good. He was reality TV, but he was good. But see, that's the thing. It's not, you know what? This is real life. I know that. This is real, and, and this is the problem. We are so into watching all this glitz, sensationalism. In that place, that historic 200-year-old building, life and death is written in on proclamations and on paper. Everything comes to that place from war to peace and everything in between. That's not a place to play with or to lie about. So Sean did it to himself. God bless him. I wish him well. Also, uh, uh, CNN <laughs> covers the news, but they cover it very professionally. Unlike Fox News, which is, I can watch it for five or 10 minutes and then it gets really annoying because they're clearly pushing an agenda rather than reporting the news. Why doesn't CNN go more in that direction? Because it seems to work for Fox. <laughs> I, I know it's taking the low road. All right, let me say road, this. Let me say this. Um, I grew up in a time, I'm just going to give you my, I can't, I don't know. I'm thankful that they gave me a job. I don't, I just can't. But let me say this. <laughs> um, I grew up in a time, I want to see more um, unbiased news. I grew up when Walter Cronkite was telling me that's the way it was. And I banked on that. That was when we had three network stations. TV went off at a, after Johnny Carson, and the flag came up at 5 a.m. And you had, I mean, I'm telling you, I'm dating myself, but I look good. So anyway, <laughs> but, but no, but what I'm saying is we didn't know his politics until after he left. And we saw him on vacation with presidents. Um, but here's my thing. I just want, and I mean, Fox has its place, CNN has its place, MSNBC has its place. I just want there to be a, a, a spot where people just get the news and then you can, you determine. I don't want there to be a crafting of your mind. And it's unfortunate. I mean, I think if we are really true to news, there are all sides of the story. It's not just two sides or one side. And I think we need to give all sides. And I think we have been, as the body of journalism, we have gone down a, a bad road. I think we're very biased now, and it's just bad. But thank you so much. Are you okay, about now you're acting Trump? like April. You can't keep asking follow-ups. I'm going to be Sarah now. It's only one question. <laughs> thank you. Hi, good evening. Thank you for all that you do. And thank you representing black women so wonderfully well. Oh, well, thank you. I am still upset losing sleep over John Kelly's lying on Frederica Wilson. Frederica Wilson. And I just wanted to ask, um, are there going to be any more follow-ups or, or He's not going to, hold... to apologize, period. OK. Stop losing sleep. <laughs> He's not going to apologize. Ask okay. that question. But here's the thing. People are standing with her. She had information, she was in that car. And what people are not talking about is that master sergeant is the one who put it on speakerphone. Mm -hmm. It was the master sergeant, the military person, who put the president on speakerphone for that whole car to hear. So it wasn't her just eavesdropping in. And yeah, Frederica Wilson wears hats. We all have some stuff about us. But she does that, she's wearing hats because in memory of her, her grandmother, and people don't know that, but she knows, she has been dealing with issues of Africa, she, for a long time. And I asked a couple of senators, I asked Senator um, Chris Coons uh, about you know, some of the things that she was saying. He said, I have no reason to doubt her. Get sleep. <laughs> Get sleep. 
I mean, it's, let me tell you something. When you see crazy coming, just know it's coming. I'm serious, because you, you cannot do harm to yourself over, because it's going to be what it's going to be. I learned that a long time ago. So, and that's one of the reasons why I stand, too. When you see, when you know the game, you know how to play it. Thank you. Hi, first I want to thank you for coming here and speaking at our university. You're a phenomenal speaker. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, my question is, what is the single most challenging thing that you've had to, had to face to get where you are? Single most challenging thing. You know what? I don't look at it as challenge. I just do what I have to do. Um, I have to work. <laughs> and I, my mother and father drilled in my head, you don't let someone take a good job from you. <laughs> you don't let, I mean, seriously. And, um, okay, I will say this. And, and Lieutenant Governor-elect, you did touch on it. I don't like talking about but Omarosa, she lied on me. Omarosa lied on me, but I'm going to tell you something. When a bully comes after you lying on you, you got to show them you're just as crazy as they are or crazier. <laughs> Not only that, and I told Hillary Clinton this, I said, you taught me something. I don't let them make my narrative. So I get out ahead of them. They try to lie on me and try to come. See, they wanted to put my head on a platter to serve it up. Mm -mm, it ain't happening. I stand on the shoulders of too many people, all of you in this room, my ancestors, my family, my church. I said, uh-uh, it's not him. So that was a chat. I couldn't believe it, because at that time, she was a so-called friend. But huh, I learned the hard way. But um, no, that was a chat. I was, I was shocked from an alleged friend um, that would tell something like that. What she said about me could have been career ending. But Robert Gibbs, and I'm going to go back, Robert Gibbs, um, during the uh, Obama years, the Salahi thing, you guys remember that, right? And he said something negative to me in the briefing room. But later when I wrote the first book, he read the part that I had in there about him. He was like this in the book. And he, and this was at MSNBC in the green room of Chris Matthews' hardball show in front of the makeup artists and the guests that were there. He said, I apologize to you. Publicly he did in that room. And he said, I had to make you look crazy and be loyal to the social secretary at the time. He taught me how to play the game. And I'm thankful for that because I see what they're doing on this side because he told me what happened over there. So if you, you gotta know how to play the game. When, once you get the game plan, you better play it. So I don't let anyone stop me from doing my job. I mean, I'm just doing, I'm just asking questions, but I think that might have been one of the most challenging times, but Gibb showed me I took it, I, I heard for a couple of weeks, couple of months, because this was going on well before you guys found out about it um, in the newspaper. And yes, we did have a fight, so, but whatever. Um, <laughs> and it's unfortunate, but once you know how to play the game, you know, but that was the most challenging time, but I keep doing what I do because I did nothing wrong. I'm just asking questions, and I'm covered by the First Amendment. Freedom of the press. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> you did a great job with uh, your water. With my what? Your water. My water? Yeah, you didn't drink any. Oh, OK, I'm going to drink some now. I've been drinking um, water all day. I know how to do it when I'm speaking. I it can looks like, like you and Don Lemon had some beef last night. <laughs> We didn't have beef. No beef? Okay. Don, Don and I are good friends. We didn't have beef. Uh huh. It's yeah. a little, look, you did it a little bit. I don't know. Okay, whatever um, you want to believe, but okay. I, we didn't have beef. <laughs> so it was about the drinking of the water. The president yeah, drinking yeah, yeah. the water. Presidents have. I have, there is video of presidents taking a sip of water, yeah. uh, po in a polished manner, and putting it back and speaking. This president brought attention to himself. So um, yeah, a couple of days ago, President Trump 
got Pre three, excuse me he, uh president trump a few days ago got the three ucla basketball players out of yeah. jail in china so do you think that's some sort of change for the president what is that change like what change like like race relations <laughs> what, what what's the point of that for him okay let me say this as president you know there are a lot of people that um he has people are held hostage or or held um, captive or whatever in jail, what have you. And his job, part of his job is to deal when he deals with these foreign leaders and, and his, his national security team works on those trying to free them. This is part of his job. Mm -hmm. It's part of his job as president. Um, now, if you think it was a kumbaya moment, is that what you feel? <laughs> no. That it my, was like <laughs> civil rights? My brother actually goes to UCLA and everyone at that school thinks it's all a joke, so. <laughs> Well, but I'm, I'm going like to say this to you. I'm going to say this to you. When you go overseas, you should never shoplift. Yeah. I, yeah. And um, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yes, sir. I wanted to thank you and the rest of the press corps for keeping it 100. I think now more than ever, the uh, free press is vitally important. And my yes. question or observation. Always. My, my question or observation is that the press briefing, briefings have become a propaganda briefing. And there's been speculation that maybe a joint sit out by the press corps might be warranted. Speculation, or is that what you want to have? Well, I'm not. I, I'm not. I haven't not, heard that. I'm not. Well, let me. There has been talk of it. I'm looking. There's been talk outside of that room. Let me tell you something. If we sit out, you lose out. Because if we're not in there asking the questions, you don't get answers. So that sit out stuff, I hear you, but that's 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 not good. The, and I agree. We need your information. The thought, of course, was that it might correct the course of their, uh, their uh, pref, be pref beatings and m make them more meaningful. But anyway, thank you for your response. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. We're not sitting out. I don't plan to sit out. If they sit out, I'm going to be in there. <laughs> I'm the only one in the room. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm, as I told you earlier, I am just so impressed with you. Oh, thank you. And really idolize you. Oh, my gosh. Um, thank you. I am a survivor of sexual abuse. Wow. And as I sit in this room today, I think I see a lot of people who can say, hashtag me too. I panic when I think about the fact that Roy Moore could actually be elected to the US Senate. And the last part of my statement before a very brief question is today I was, I, I'm a registered Democrat, but I have to tell you I was so relieved to see the response of the media and the electors in DC on Al Franken. Because what I think today shows that it really isn't about political parties, whether you're Democrat or Republican. It's what's right. You're it's what's right. right. And the heart, yes. And so my question to you today, with all of these women who believe in women moving forward, and I would think a lot of the men who are here because they care about our issues, and people like me who have been sexually abused, even to the point of being raped, how do we capitalize on this moment? where women all across this country now are getting the courage to speak up and tell their stories. How can we help you help ourselves through this moment in time? As a journalist, when these moments happen, people speak up. You telling your story right now has touched someone and someone hears it and they may come to you and open up to you. But when these things happen, it takes women, it takes men, it takes people to come out and stand up and say, we're not taking it anymore. You, moments like this is when you capitalize on the momentum to stop it, to create laws, to, to change, to shift the atmosphere, to make it uncomfortable for this to be okay. 
Um, but my concern about these moments, we're hearing a lot of stuff, but we have to, we're hearing a lot of people, but we have to remember we are still a country that you're innocent until proven guilty. And a lot of people have been, and the only reason why I say that is because people will smear you, and I don't want it to, to, to devolve into something else. There are a lot of people out here like yourself who have had, who've been violated, and you stand with like-minded people and march and, and push for change. But what I don't want people to do and what I'm fearful of, when moments like this happen, they start and start smearing people and people get scared. And because people, we've seen this kind of thing before mm -hmm. because we've been lied on as a people. Exactly. So I just wanna make sure that we keep it where it is. And Roy Moore, <laughs> yeah. that's a bad situation. Politically, morally, ethically, everything. How that plays out, I don't know. But I tell you what, the president's silence is deafening. The president's silence is deafening. And he's got to say something. That's his own party. He's got senators, U.S. senators, talking about expelling him if he wins. You know, there's conversations that Jeff Sessions could wind up going back to Alabama. You can't write this reality show. <laughs> um, but no, this is a time where you capitalize on the momentum and you push for change to help another person to prevent what happened to you happening again. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Here she comes. <laughs> okay. Hi, Ms. Ryan. Hello. Uh, so earlier I was going to ask you, how do you go to work every day knowing that oftentimes you're not going to be taken seriously as the professional that you are? Uh, but I want to add to that and ask, how do you go to work knowing that you're not going to get an answer? You're going to get the omission of facts and you're going to get fabricated lies. How do you keep going? What motivates you? And sarcasm and talked about. And, yeah. and everything. Because we've seen you on TV being treated as if you don't deserve to be there. So but guess what motivates what? you? Guess what? I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> Not only am I there. <laughs> I used to sit in the back of the room. <laughs> I'm smack dab in the middle, third row. They cannot miss me. Sarah looks at me. I, we have eye contact, and she looks all like, mm -hmm, you see me. Mm -hmm. Let me say this to you. <laughs> Senator Kamala Harris said to me, you still go back. I'm like, and so do you. So <laughs> it's not a coincidence that several women have been targeted. Um, in the last couple. I don't think it's a coincidence. I do not. Um, and I'm, and let's even go further. They put a target on my head. Um, the weekend that I received the um, National Association of Black Journalists, Journalists of the Year Award in New Orleans was the weekend of Charlottesville. That happened like Saturday. Sunday, the administration had this campaign ad talking about those who are thwarting the president's agenda. I'm like, oh, okay. That Sunday morning, I get crazy amounts of uh, emails and calls. April, April, have you seen this? I'm like, what are you talking about? I send my children to the mall because I was very upset and I had to con compose myself. 23 seconds in is my face. I am the only White House correspondent that's targeted or, or put on that ad. The rest of them, Don Lemon, talk show hosts, Don Lemon, Wolf Blitzer, Rachel Maddow, Anderson Cooper. I'm like, I'm in, I'm in good company, but I'm like, why me? And that weekend of Charlottesville, that was not good. So let me say this to you. My mother used to always say when she was alive, God rest her soul, 
She said, it's not what they call you, but what you answer to. I don't answer to that stuff. I walk in there doing a job, the same job I've been doing with Bill Clinton's administration, with George W. Bush's administration, with Barack Obama's administration. There's nothing different, nothing different. Not only that, like I told the gentleman earlier, I know what the game is. They want to discredit me. When you know the game, you know how to play it. So I'm, I go in asking questions, doing my job. One, no one's going to take that job from me unless I'm ready to go. Two, I did nothing wrong. Three, they're mad with me because I ask questions that they may not like, but we're the first line of questioning an American president. And when they silence us, see, they thought they could pick me off because I'm an African-American woman working for a smaller network, but they didn't realize I was strong and they're from Baltimore. <laughs> so Sean thought he was going to get me with shaking my head. And the president wanted me to get the people together. And I didn't. And then Sarah, Sarah. She's snarky, and I'm like, okay, whatever. It's the state of play every day. It's like when I walk in, it's like, what level of crazy are we in today? <laughs> That's it. I mean, I know it going. So once you know the ground rules, you are good. So don't feel sorry for me. Just pray for me. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, thank you so much for your speech and for being here today. Your speech was incredible and inspiring. Oh thank you. Um, but I my almost cried was, with Harriet Tubman. I was like, oh my God, I'm crying. Um, but my question was, when you say that we're the change we seek in the world, which 100%, but in your experience, what are the best mediums to seek that change? Um, I don't think it's, I think it's more so, again, that blueprint People matter. Not one person, but when you have people together, people pay attention. Once you get people together, that's when you go to the mediums and you speak in force, you march. You can get on social media, fine. You can get a little blue check to verify, you fine. But when you have the numbers behind you, when you have the numbers, that's when you got street cred. So. And that's what people pay attention to. So you got to get the masses with you. Join in a group and be heard and be seen and make noise. Go to the Hill. Go to, um, go to your, your, your state uh, capital. Go to City Hall. But come in numbers. One person is like, OK. But when you come in numbers too big to ignore, you got Sean Spicer or Sarah Huckabee at the podium screaming. Okay, and that's when you have the leverage to say, okay, this media, that media, we're here. And they'll be clamoring to talk to you. Right now, you might be a mosquito flying around on Twitter, but you want to be a hornet's nest, you know, for the media. You want to, you just come in numbers and then start searching, okay? But, but start talking to people, like-minded people. I hope I helped you. You're welcome. Good evening, Ms. Ryan. How are Good you? Good evening. I'm fine. How are you? Um, after listening to your speech, I'm much better. Oh. Why were you in the fetal position? <laughs> yes, I am. I have a, a two-part question. You're not curled up right now, but you look good. You're all right. <laughs> I'm trying to follow your footsteps. Okay. So my question is it's a two-part question. Yes, sir. First part, you think Trump is going to finish? Come second on. part. <laughs> second part. Do you think that there's going to be some disastrous consequence with North Korea? Oh, you come, you come wanting some answers. Mm -hmm. You come getting, me, getting ready to get me in trouble. <laughs> All right, let me say this. He's going to make year one. OK, he's going to make the first year. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, let me say, and I'm serious. I am so serious, please. You know, he's going to make year one, but we don't know. This president has a way of going on Twitter and getting in trouble. He did it to himself every time. Kefefe, 
the, the wiretapping from the microwave and all that other stuff. I'm like, <sighs> and then we have to cover it because that stuff is official. And then Sarah gets, Sarah or Sean or whomever gets up there and tries to shift it and play with it. And I'm like, hmm, I don't know. I mean, it could be Mueller. It could be a discontent. The numbers could be, let me say this, the Republican Party holds the key. Mm -hmm. When those numbers drop to the point where they are like, okay, they will walk away from him to try to save 2018. Okay, so it's all about the numbers. Size matters. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, y'all. <laughs> all right. Uh, but they will run away, if, if the numbers aren't right, the Republicans, let me tell you something, there's buyer's remorse, big time. You only hear a couple of them. Let me tell you what I hear. And I've got more Republicans calling me, giving me information than anything. And people are like, where is she going to? Don't worry about it. It's true. Because when I tell you, write it down. They are telling me. And I'm, it's amazing. So Republicans are not happy. They're, and it, and if, if there's some damning information from Mueller, there are a couple of things. Mueller and those poll numbers. And then there's also whatever the president does that people may not like. Now in North Korea. <sighs> I'm concerned um, because over the years as I've covered White Houses and administrations, there are several countries that, be it the axis of evil or whatever, that has been taboo, if you want, if you will. One of those is Iran, and the other one is North Korea. Why? Because we have a black hole when it comes to intelligence on what they have. It's dangerous. The president's talking about boots on the ground. We are war weary. Mm -hmm. We are tired. We're financially teetering. You know, he's saying everything's great. We're trying to come out. Financially, it would knock us out. We already owe China a lot of money for, for the Gulf War, um, the Iraq War and Gulf War. So, I don't know. This president wants to, to he, he says things to, to scare people, but you got a crazy man over there who's Dennis Rodman's friend. <laughs> and you don't know, you know, you got Omarosa's friend over here and Dennis Rodman's friend over here. You don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> So <laughs> you just don't know which way it's going to go. But I'm praying for the country. The human part of me is praying for the country and our soldiers. So I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank, Thank you. And it's good not to see you in the fetal position. Thank you. Good evening. I feel like I want to cry. And I want to cry because when I am in a room with people such as yourself, and Don't our cry. upcoming lieutenant governor. She's a strong sister. And people like Janine LaRue, who used to be a spokesperson for our university. I feel like I want to cry because it's so humbling. Oh. Your message tonight causes me to think about all of these young ladies in here who are coming behind me. I hope that in their lifetime, they will see, if not, another African-American male, president, perhaps a female. African-American, white, I don't really care. But I am hoping <laughs> that in our lifetime, or their lifetime especially, they will see that. And I came here tonight after running home oh. to make certain that I could watch the news today and the press conference. And I, I wanted it. to see the audience, crazy. and I wanted to see Sarah's face when she walked in and looked around like she always does, because I always say she's looking for April. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, she gives me eye contact. And, 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 let me, and, and the reason why I'm saying this is because these young ladies in here who someday may serve on various boards, they have to understand 
that if they're the only female in the room, yes. or maybe one of two, yes. they have to get up and speak up. Yes. I have been on too many boards and watched too many females who will sit there because they are happy that they are there. And every time I watch you, I say to myself, she is not reticent. She knows she may be the only one there, but she speaks up. April, you speak up every time. And sometimes, through nonverbal communication, and these young ladies <laughs> gotta learn this, those gazes that you get oh my God. when you speak, that's enough to write your number three book. <laughs> Because the and they me. look at you when you're, you can't see that. We see it because we're watching TV. <laughs> and I just want you to say to the young ladies tonight that when they are in a situation and they are one or two in the room and everyone else is male, I don't care what the color is and what the persuasion may be, they have to get up and do like you. Speak up. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're awesome. Um, my memes have gone viral, and I think it's almost time to wrap this up. No, okay. I was well, ask okay. If we could just take the like maybe three or four questions there, but just do them rapid fire. Yeah, rapid fire. Let's do rapid fire. And you can pull them all together. And uh, yeah, we'll do rapid fire because I have to sign books and I have to have a hard out because I gotta go home to my babies, um, my 15-year-old and my 10-year-old, if you don't mind. Thank you. But um. Um, for all the young ladies um, and young men um, who are the only, be it Asian, be it African American, be it whatever, um, it's nice to have the M bins or even the Tesla and the red bottoms. But you know what? <laughs> you will do yourself and your community a disservice if you do not bring who you are to the table. That's why you were hired in a lot of instances. So, um, yeah, I asked about Russia. I learned about Russian salad dressing from Sean Spicer, too. <laughs> I asked about a whole bunch of stuff, but I also asked why the water is unsafe to drink in Flint. I also asked about Sarah. Does this administration think slavery is wrong? And I got so many death threats. I've been getting death threats for the last year. It's ridiculous, but y'all pray for me. That's all I got to say. All right, so let's do rapid fire. The next three questions I'm just going to ask. Just ask your question, each one of you, and I'm going to hit you with it, the answer. Hi. Hi. Well, for me, I'm pretty young. I'm 15 years old. And uh, I... It's okay. Stop. Keep on going. Keep going. Keep going. And... Where I go to school, it's like predominantly white and predominantly racist, but I still want to bring about change. Yeah, but I still want to bring about change. So how do you suppose I bring about change in an area that is so saturated with ignorance? Oh, OK. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to answer you. My children are in that same situation. I'm going to answer you, because we're going to do rapid fire. Thank you, my 15-year-old. OK, yes. Give her a big round of applause for having the I'm not 15 years old. <laughs> I'm, from, I'm, I'm from the Bronx, and I went to graduate school and engineering school where there was no women's bathroom, so that oh really gosh. resonates with me. I now get to do bodily functions in the building with the other people. Uh, <laughs> anyway, how can you hope that Trump is going to respond to the Moore situation when, in fact, more women accused him and, and he got elected anyway. Let me say anyway. this. He's the leader of the free world, right? We have been asking him. He said, we asked him about that thing that happened with Billy Bush. He said, oh, it was a locker room situation. He is, he and other presidents are the moral leader of this country. He's got to deal with this issue. And yes, that might bring, it, no, it's not might, it will bring up the past for him, but he still has to talk about war. he's not going to. It's, well, I don't know. You're, you say, I'm hoping, I'm not hoping. He is, we, let me tell you, I asked uh, Barack Obama about uh, Bill Cosby in July of 2015, he answered, when that was supposed to be the Iran press conference, I was like, oh, how dare she ask about Bill Cosby? Well, guess what I did? Um, 
when Bill Clinton had his issue with Monica and all the other stuff going on, we asked, you know, and he gave answers. Trust me, he will have to answer about Ray Moore. Trust me. Okay. His party, he's going to say something at some point. At some point, trust me, I know the rhythms of this place. Trust me, Ray Moore is, Steve Bannon is supporting Ray Moore. He did not support Ray Moore. Mitch McConnell is calling for him. The Republicans are calling for him. He, he's going to have to say something. I hope you're OK. Thank you. OK, next. I'm sorry. I was supposed to do rapid fire, the 15-year-old. I'll try to be rapid. Hi, Ms. Ryan. My name is Nina Rogers. Thank Hi. you for your wisdom tonight. My question, um, as you were speaking, I was thinking about the coverage. This is not on the mic. I, I was thinking about the coverage leading up to the election uh, and how stories would so frequently come in that the public could easily get distracted uh, by one thing. Like shortly after the Access Hollywood tapes were released, Hillary Clinton story, like it was that cycle. So I guess my question to you is how can uh, journalists specifically help to keep the public on track, if you will, um, as these stories come in? Like I think about now, like the federal court appointees uh, right. that are like, you Thank know you. What? Thank you. I got you. And, and the next lady. Hi, Ms. Ryan. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering what inspired you to become a journalist? Like was it an experience or a certain person? Um, what inspired you to be a journalist? Okay, rapid fire. Okay, what expire, inspired me to be a journalist? I really don't know, but I know this for a fact that I was, um, I, I knew I couldn't sit all day at a desk, and I knew something was wrong with me. I wanted to be, I started out as a DJ. I had the bug for broadcasting, but I said, being a DJ, telling, and, and there's nothing wrong with being a DJ, but telling the time, temp, and temperature, time, and temperature, and station ID, I wanted more. And I love news. My father was a couch potato. All he would do is watch Walter Cronkite, listen to the news. My mother was very involved in current events um, and new current events. So what I did is, I guess I brought everything that I knew, and it, it, it's worked. Um, I love news. I love knowing what's going on. And I love the world. I love, I'm a student of the world. I'm a student of, I guess, history now, being there for 20 years. So that's, um, that's not one particular thing, but I think it's what I've known throughout my life. I mean, before we heard about news junkies, my, I guess my parents were news junkies before it was actually a, a term. Um, going to the young lady who said that she goes to, um, she's a 15 year old. Um, my children attend a school now that is similar to yours. And they have this organization called, um, well they have an organization for the black students. They have different organizations uh, for different groups. and. Over the last couple of months, there's a small group of parents who said, it should not, we don't like this diversity thing. Everybody should be together. I'm like, mm, really? And they're trying to bust it up. But what I say is, is that we are global. We are everyone. We need to appreciate everyone. And, and if you show people that you can embrace them and hang with like-minded people, they will ultimately start learning about you and embracing you prayerfully. And that's what I tell my children. My children hang with black, white, Jew, Gentile, Protestant, Catholic. She hangs with a lot of different kids. Some of them don't always understand, you know, when the taking the knee thing happened. Oh my God, that was the worst thing that happened in that high school. Um, they were having a fit about it. Even some of the kids came in dressed in the flag trying to make the black kids angry. But it's about education and enlightenment. And we sometimes have to enlighten just by our walk and our talk and who we are. So I encourage you to be who you are and find like-minded people and work through it because you are the change in that school. You are the change in that community. And you could actually change someone's mind in a lot of ways. And I know it's tough, and it's tough for a 15-year-old, but I encourage you to, to keep it going. I want to talk to you after, wherever you went. I want to talk, there you go. I encourage you, I want to talk to you afterwards. Um, and for the lady um, who said, uh, what did she say? She said, how do we stay focused? We can't stay focused because they're throwing everything at us. So you can't stay focused. And you mentioned that the Access Hollywood tape, well, that day, the Russia, story came out from the Homeland Security and the CIA, I believe, and within 45 minutes, 
you know, access Hollywood. That was off the track. It's, I have never seen it. I mean, we have one thing, one minute, next thing he tweets or something does. And it's too much. All right, now I hear the chattering class over here. <laughs> so some of it's purposeful. They want to keep you off your game, so they want to throw the shiny object over here so you don't look at what's really going on over there. But we continue to try to stay on what's happening over here. Yeah, the shiny object may get us for a minute, but we come back over here. Shiny object, they throw it out. But okay. So we, we keep trying to go back, and I encourage you, like I said earlier, look it up. If you, if you don't hear about it, somebody's working on it. Google it. Google the story that you're looking for, the, the issue that you're looking for. Someone is working on it. And I'm going to tell you, beyond CNN, which is a great website for news, um, CNN.com, go there and look for stories that you're, the, the issues that you're looking for. If you don't get it there, I, I like a, a, a website called The Hill, Real Clear Politics. Um, the Washington Post. Um, you know, I, I watch a lot of news, read a lot of news all the time. And if look, just Google the stories. Look for credible news sources. And I hate to say that some of the social media outlets are the worst places to get your news from because they give you sensational headlines and you don't look at the byline seeing where it's from. That is fake news. So... <laughs> So I um, thank you all. I'm being told we're going to shut this down. Um, I'm doing a book signing, I think, yeah. right now. And thank you all. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. You are the change that you seek. If you have a disease, fix it. Thank you.